Good morning, and welcome to What's New This Week with David Luna. Please let me introduce the president of CAMP, Ms. Audrey Boystown. Audrey? Thank you so much, Megan. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us. It's always good to have this amount of people showing up to listen to the pearls of wisdom that will fall from Dave Luna's lips and enlighten us about what is happening in the mortgage market this moment. So before we get into it, I um, just want to talk about what is upcoming for us. So on Friday at 11 o'clock, we will have Barry Habib. On Monday, the following Monday, we're going to have Isaac Jacobson, who will be talking about landlord and tenant rights during Corona. That'll be good for all of us and our investors to understand that a little better. Next Tuesday, again, we're going to have David. And um, then on Thursday, April 30th, we'll have Patrick Galvin. And then on May 1st and 2nd, we have a mortgage educator's 20-hour um, pre-licensing class being taught by Kevin Casey, our president-elect. I just want to remind everyone of a few things. First of all, it is time for you to be members of CAMP. Please go to our website, thecampsite.org, and join if you haven't already or renew your membership. And also know that yesterday we sent out a call to action asking our legislators to please renew the SBA financing, or not financing, um, loans that were available to small businesses. And we have had a tremendous amount of response, but it's really, really important for our legislators to hear from all of us and know that we care about this and not just for ourselves as mortgage brokers who might be eligible for this money, but also for our clients who are small business owners who missed out on the first round and are really, really struggling. So please, please, if you didn't get that link, if you don't know what I'm talking about, please contact us and we'll make sure you get it. Um, you don't actually have to be a CAMP or NAM member to click on the link and have your voice be heard, even though you should be a CAMP member for sure. Um, but with all of that, I am very excited to turn it over to Dave Luna, who we appreciate so very much. And welcome, Dave. Thank you. Wow, a lot of stuff going on. That last piece that you talked about getting hold of um, uh, Congress, uh, those efforts you will you will see realized today. So I've been up now here for a few hours and I've already done a, an interview for a publication on the East Coast uh, about what I'm gonna share with you guys right now. So today, FHFA announced that Fannie and Freddie will only require four months of payments advanced to them for loans on forbearance. The liquidity issue that the industry has been very, very nervous about, it appears that it might have been solved. So from FHFA's press release, it said, once a servicer has advanced four months of missed payments on a loan, it will have no further obligation to advance scheduled payments. Now this applies to all enterprise servicers, regardless of type, or size. This is super, super important and because I don't want to say it wrong, I'm going to quote the uh, press release that happened today. Quote, the four-month servicer advance obligation limit for loans and forbearance provides stability and clarity to the five trillion enterprise-backed housing finance market, said FHFA Director Mark Calabria. Mortgage servicers can now plan for exactly how long they will need to advance principal and interest payments on loans for which borrowers have not made their monthly payment. So Fannie Mae's servicers are responsible for advancing principal and interest payments. Freddie Mac servicers, don't know if you guys knew this, are only obligated to advance the four months of Miss Borrower interest payments. So remember, the Secretary of the Treasury holds the purse strings of the GSEs, meaning the Treasury bailed out the GSEs before and still holds them in conservatorship and controls the preferred stock. So I don't know. I don't know if we're done with this. My feeling is if this isn't enough, we're going to see something else. So if the Secretary of the Treasury, the Federal Reserve, feels that FHFA is not doing what it needs to safeguard conventional lenders, they may still step in to provide needed liquidity. So here's the whole situation explained. Uh, take all the weeks, all of the hours that we've been talking about. Let me make it a super, super succinct and very, very simple. Fannie and Freddie take on the credit risk of conventional loans in exchange for a G fee or a guarantee fee. 
Now notice the first word, guarantee. So the default kicks in at about 120 days late. Well, so because we're in this forbearance 120 day clock, the clock for being late has not started yet. And the servicers needs to pay the GSE payments. So that's been that's been the problem of what's going on here is the clock hasn't started. The GSE has hundreds of billions of dollars available to them today, right now. The money's already been allocated. So thinking worst case scenario, and we can hear your microphone person, whoever's whoever's making the noise, we can hear it. Thinking worst case scenario, the total amount estimated to go into default is only going to be about hundred billion dollars. We remove the government component of that, okay, maybe $60 billion is only available in conventional loans. So you take out the 40 of government, we're really, really, really only talking about $60 billion in conventional loans, and they already have hundreds of billions of dollars. So why the director is still sitting or waiting on the sidelines, I don't know. As a result of his actions, or maybe better said, his inaction, uh, there's been this, these compressed market condition causing decisions to be made that hurt, not help the market. Potentially maybe closing some of the smaller lenders, causing margin calls to happen, additional overlays, virtually shutting down uh, market segments like jumbo, right? So because of today's announcement, we may start to see overlays begin to be removed. Can I have a yay on that one? What lenders have been doing is crafting. I mean, the, the only kind of loans lenders have been doing right now, it's a very, very good, we'll call it a great loan, so that they know they can eventually sell it if they need the money. So speaking about FHA and the CFPB, they unveiled a new program since we last talked on April 15th. It's called the BPP, the Borrower Protection Plan, which allows the CFPB and FHFA to share information about what lenders are doing regarding loan forbearance, loan mods, and things like that. Now, this information will then be made available to the CFPB. So from the CFPB's website, they said, quote, help for consumers is always here at the CFPB through our complaints process. In addition to working with your lender to get an answer for you, we analyze the information to better educate consumers, provide clear rules for financial institutions, and hold companies available said the CPB director. Through the partnership being announced today, the Bureau will share our insights with FHFA and ensure we get their data on how mortgage servicers are working with their customers during this critical time and moving forward. Then the director of FHFA, Mark Calabria said, quote, protecting and helping homeowners during this national crisis is my top priority. No one should be worried about losing their home, end quote. I'm going to keep my comments to myself. That's what the director said. What the director does is a little bit different. I'm, I'm not even going to touch it because I'm, I'm trying to be a nice person. Now, we haven't touched the taxes and insurance issues. We're only talking about principal and interest or interest, depending on if it's Fannie or Freddie. Now, some parts of California have taxes that are huge that need to be paid monthly. For example, let's go to Marin County. They levy an annual $5,500 a year in property taxes. Multiply that number by the number of mortgages that are asking for forbearance, and you can see quickly how the money needed for those mortgages can escalate. Add to that the P&I payments, and the numbers could be devastating for small companies, even if this continues for four months. The average mortgage payment in the state right now is $2,577. Take 2577, take the $5,500 divided by 12, and you're seeing per loan those numbers just, just be, become a very, very big number very, very quickly. Black Knight estimates that about 5% of GSE mortgages and 7.6 of Govies are in forbearance as of April 16th, five days ago. Now, we told you last week that non QM lenders were planning to return into the mortgage space. Ladies and gentlemen, you should have started to see yesterday and today more and more non-QM non -QM lenders come back. We are telling you today that Jumbo is starting to come back as well. 
Now, it's going to be different than we had three, four weeks ago, but at least we're starting to see some light at the end of the tunnel. Now, regarding forbearance, this was an interesting video that I saw yesterday about an LO working with very, very, very qualified borrowers. Good job, good DTI, high FICO score. I mean, just really, really rock solid borrowers. One of the borrowers had co-signed with their mom on a mortgage. Mom went into forbearance and the borrowers now are not eligible to get a loan. So what they need to do is they need to get mom's mortgage current and out of forbearance before they can move forward on their home loan. Shifting gears to Experian. Experian also put out a great forbearance piece in their blog since we last met. It includes not just mortgage, but credit card and student loan forbearance. Maybe this is coming from, uh, maybe because it's coming from Experian, more people will check it out. Also from the credit bureaus, Forbes reported yesterday, April 20th, that everyone can get a free credit report from the credit bureaus at annualcreditreport.com. Listen, weekly from now until April 20th. No scores, but free reports every single week uh, for, you know, all the way until April 2021. So starting April 20 to April 2021, everybody can get free copies of their credit report. Other things on the home front, California Senate Bill 1322, the state's remote online notarization bill. It was uh, sponsored by uh, Senator Susan Rubio of, uh, of the LA area. The last update on the state's website was April 3rd. It was, uh, it was read a second time and then it was amended and then it was referred to the Committee on Rules. Remember, the legislature is not in session, so there's limited progress there. It's still tough out there. We, we saw another 5.2 people uh, seeking unemployment benefits. And so the total now is 22 million people have filed jobless claims in the last month. And what that means is all the new jobs created since 2008 are gone. All new employment created is gone. On the travel front, less than 91,000 people passed through TSA checkpoints on April 15th. The same day last year, just as comparison, 91,000. Last year, 2.3 million. Also, the 1003 has been updated. It will now go into effect March 1st. 2021. So we have roughly 10 months to get ready for it. Uh, it's been pushed back and pushed back and pushed back, but it looks like it might finally, you know, actually go into reality. Let's see what happens. Almost a fifth of S&P 500 companies are scheduled to report first quarter earnings this week. So we're going to get a look at how coronavirus has affected those companies. Now, before we do a q and I've been asked, you know, some questions that I just want to answer up front. Dave, what about appraisals not being due until 120 days after the loan closes? Ladies and gentlemen, yes, that is true, but it only pertains to banks and credit unions. The announcement can be found on the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve website. It said federal banking agencies today issued an interim final rule to temporarily defer real estate related appraisals and evaluations under the agency's interagency appraisal regulations this these changes would be in effect until the end of the year it this does not change what most of us on this um webinar are doing but i just wanted to share the answer before i would ask and sometimes sometimes ladies and gentlemen you guys ask me some off the wall questions let me share this one um the question was hey dave when will Clorox and Lysol become available? And I thought, well, okay, let me go research that. I want you to think back on how cool the economy was humming along before COVID-19. Almost everybody was working. We had really, really low unemployment. Now we ask these companies that are providing a product to just jack it up by 150 to 200% overnight. It's not realistic to require that from a company. So to answer the question, mid-May, June, you should see store shelves return back to normal. This is another reason why I think the mortgage will uh, industry will be back to their new normal by midsummer. The CFPB is still working. Yes, working from home. Um, we told when we started doing classes at the beginning of the year that in May, about 10 days from now, 
that the CFPB would be coming out with a new rule regarding QM or qualified mortgages, possibly eliminating that 43% back end DTI. It looks like that might not happen because of COVID and everything. So um, we'll keep you updated as to what's changing. If you guys ask the question, well, Dave, what were they going to replace DTI with? In one word, they were going to replace it with seasoning. Dave, what's seasoning? If the borrower is already paying a housing expense that will be equal to what their new housing expense is going to be, and they've been paying it for a while, what does it matter what the DTI was? So I, I, I understand it's a little bit more of a common sense approach. And I'm thinking, wow, you guys are actually thinking. So we're not talking payment shock. I mean, if Bob and Betty borrower were, were paying X and with the new house, they're paying X, and they've shown that they can pay it, cool. So if we don't have in May a new QM guideline or rule by the CFPB, what might happen is they might extend the QM patch past January 2021. We'll keep you informed as soon as we hear something. Tiari, Hawaii, how are you? Okay, this is a California thing. What are you doing from Hawaii listening in? All right. So reports to watch, we got the housing data that'll be coming out today. That's on existing home sales. And on Thursday, new home sales. And so we've been saying kind of some negative things right here. And I, I really, really, really do apologize. So I want to end with good news. All right. Oil prices yesterday. Wow. That's never happened before. So West Texas intermediate crude for May delivery closed at minus. $37.63. Dave, what does that mean? That means it was cheaper for them to deliver oil or going to deliver oil and not just free, they would pay somebody $37.63 per gal, you know, per barrel to say, here, you take it off our hands. So they get it for free and they get a check. That's never, ever, ever, ever happened. So what does that mean? Well, there's no room to store it. And so I was looking at today's oil prices right before this webinar started. Uh, they are back in positive territory, but what does all this mean to you? And why am I taking our you know, super valuable time to share it with you? It means gas prices will continue to fall. So just enjoy it. Uh, it's gonna be cheaper to run that car if it is really only to the grocery store. Okay, COVID-19 did keep new home buyers at home. Refinances are up 10% over even last week, and they are up 192% over a year ago. Your pipelines should be full. Now, uh, a friend of mine, an old friend of mine, Doug Duncan, who's the Senior VP and Chief Economist at Fannie Mae said, this past week compared to 2019, Refis are expected to pick up in 2020 by approximately $400 billion to $1.41 trillion. So if you don't have a piece of that, please go out and get it because it's, it's low-hanging fruit. It's going to be very, very good. So please go out there and do it. On what was traditionally a dreaded day, April 15th, you know, tax day, something different from the IRS happened. The IRS rolled out the get my payment website that get my payment went live so people can check on this on the status of their economic impact payment on the site it can also qu answer questions about eligibility payment amounts what to expect when to expect it that's a pretty cool website from the irs from the cfpb april 16th so notice everything i'm sharing with you is like less than seven days old for most people, you won't have to do anything. The payment will be directly deposited in your bank account or sent to you by check. Be aware, however, that if it's by check, it might take a little bit longer. Gavin Newsom held a press conference that the state has, quote, bent the curve on the number of infections from COVID-19. So the next phase really should be a more careful return to normal, Again, whatever the heck that looks like, we should see more lifting of restrictions very, very soon. I grew up in Southern California, so I'm used to ABC uh, Channel 7. And so I'm watching the protests and people don't like being at home. And, and I understand that. 
but we 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 got to we got to finish this correctly. We've made some good progress. It won't be like the flipping on of a light switch. It'll be more of a more of a gradual purposeful turning of a dial, uh, you know, just more and more and more and more. I, I don't think it's just going to be boom all of a sudden we're we're out. Gavin or Newsom uh, shared a set of policies to be followed, like for example with restaurants. Uh, for example, restaurants may take your temperature at the door. They may require servers to wear gloves and masks. They may reduce the number of tables to increase the physical distancing and also provide disposable menus. Dr. Newell from Santa Cruz County said that she was, quote, working with regional and state health officials to draft a less restricted shelter in place order to start May 4th. She said, we're looking to lift some of those restrictions. Now, I have Tiari in, in Hawaii. I've got California here. Let's just, for laughs and giggles, throw in Texas. So Texas, Texas's economy, which is second to California, announced, quote, opening in Texas must occur in stages, said Governor Abbott during his briefing last Friday. Obviously, not all businesses can open all at once on May 1. So hopefully you guys are seeing from the president, from the governor of California, from the governor of Texas, from state health people, you know, like we were we were just talking about Dr. Newell in Santa Cruz County, it looks like we may be able to start moving around. Uh, rates still look like they're generally moving lower, as I've been telling you guys for months. I do see a spring buying season, but it will be temporarily moved this year to summer, okay? Finally, before we meet again on Monday, April 27th, so the day before we're supposed to meet again at 10 a.m., a budget subcommittee will meet. All are encouraged to watch the hearing live stream at assembly.ca.gov front slash today's events. It'll be a hearing on COVID-19 recovery and stimulus. Let's hope we hear some good news coming out of that. For you small business owners, remember our president was talking about, you know, get a hold of your a representative, your senator, let me tell you something, and this is ahead of the curve. Nobody else is telling you this, ready? The Senate should pass today another relief bill to help small businesses, okay? Today. So all of your efforts, congratulations. They heard us in DC. Uh, Audrey, I think you said 1,500 people you know, at least in California, hopefully across the nation, there was more. But anyway, uh, many, many folks contacted their uh, representatives, their uh, their uh, legislators. And today, you should have the Paycheck Protection Program passed on the Senate side, which is designed to help small businesses suffering from the coronavirus outbreak because the past one just ran out of money last week. So it looks like California has bent the curve. The worst is probably behind us. Things will start to return to our new normal very, very soon. I would say probably in less than two weeks. So hopefully we can start moving about in a more responsible manner and allow the economy to start back up again. And so with your guys' permission, I'm done and I'm ready to answer questions. Sabina, you're welcome oh. for our support. You got it. Okay. Madam President, do we have any questions? My goodness, there is a lot to talk about. I don't, I don't know where to start. Um, I think I let's start with. Um, so they made an announcement. Who's they? That the, Who's they? The, well, the FHFA, I presume. Who who yes. made the announcement about the servicing issue? I think it was FHFA. If you, if you go they to made FHFA an announcement. Website, you can see it on their website. So at this point. I mean, at what point do they give actual guidelines to these poor guys? And is four months really going to help them? I mean, isn't it going to require more than that to fix the problem for the servicers? I, I would agree on both of those things. So where's more guidance? So on FHFA's website, most of us are just originators, so we're not servicers. So this is new uncharted territory for us. But if you go to FHFA, uh, maybe you are a servicer and you can chime in and help us all understand this better. But we didn't know whether they were going to be on a two, four, six, 12 month forbearance where the servicers would have to advance the payments. Now, at least we have a lifetime, meaning four. 
that's it for. So if you actually look at the numbers from April and we're coming up on May, May will be very, very interesting month to see are more people going to now miss their second, so far they've only missed one, will they be missing their second mortgage payment? And so uh, I, again, now for the smaller uh, servicers are like, oh my goodness, oh my goodness, even though I paid the guarantee fee, I'm not gonna get any help until they're behind four months. And then after four months, if they've really, really been unemployed, do we now have to kick that into foreclosure? So the G fee only helped if the borrowers were late, the clock hadn't even started, but notice how everything tends to be 120 days. Everything, everything, they gotta be late for 120 days. They gotta miss four payments on forbearance. So uh, it's really Fannie and Freddie that's supposed to be collecting these payments. And there's a G fee paid to Fannie and Freddie to collect these payments. And yet Fannie and Freddie was sitting on the sidelines. Now we're not going to do anything. So at least for some, this is extremely positive news. So I also mentioned that the Federal Reserve may have to step in if FHFA has not done enough to help the uh, businesses. And by the way, the money's already sitting there. The money's there already. Right, right. That's what I've heard too, is the money's so, there. They should just be helping. Right. So while you come up with the next question, Richard, are brokers going to go by the wayside? Absolutely not. Why? We're the engine that's going to keep all of this still, you know, still humming along. So uh, as an essential uh, a business or service, no, brokers are still going to be very, very healthy, very, very strong as we continue. How are we going to move all of that money in refinances if we don't have a workforce, i.e. brokers, that will help uh, move this along? So Richard, there, there you go. Okay, Audrey. So there was more on this forbearance issue. So um, they're asking, as, as we know that people are getting different answers when they're calling their servicers. And I was told by a servicer that they have, that each person, that each servicer has been given a script by uh, Fannie and Freddie about the questions they should be asking, et cetera, et cetera, and what people are supposedly agreeing to. But the question is, what is the standard repayment for a forbearance? Some of my clients are being told that it will be added to the end of the loan. Other services are telling clients it needs to be paid at the end of the forbearance period in full after 90 days. What is the true uh, repayment time on a forbearance? And I think the question, the answer is, it depends, right? Okay, you, so you take that one. We, we covered this, not last week, but the week before. So maybe we have new uh, viewers this time. And so let's cover that again. Ladies and gentlemen, you have two different kinds of loans. So even if a script was given to the servicers from Fannie and Freddie, that would be a conventional loan. What happens to forbearance on government loans? And number two, as we were, you know, as we were visiting, I think everybody's throwing into a pot, you know, everything is, you know, forbearance. People don't do that. We talked about the difference between forbearance, right? And deferral. So depending on what we're talking about on forbearance and deferral, in one case, yes, we miss April. Yes, we miss May. Yes, we miss June. But then, you know, by July, we're kind of back to normal. And we used an example of someone, Audrey, we both know and love. And so this particular loan officer just called just for, you know, just for a question, just to ask. Uh, her payment's $4,000 a month. And she said, okay, so if I miss April, May, June, so 4,000, 4,000, 4,000, and on July 1, what happens? Her servicer said, you got to pay back $16,000. So that right. is one option. The other options, if we're going to defer, it means that we're going to add that to the end of the loan for however long that loan is. Now, if the loan is a 30-year loan, they were looking at 30 years plus three months to keep our example consistent. Well, Dave, am I, is it going to show negative on my credit report? No, but I'll answer that question in a second. So what happens if I refi, I sell the home, I win the lottery? People, that three months now comes due. So if you refi, the entire balance, interest, everything comes due. If you sell, it all comes due. So it's on there for the life of that loan, however long that is. 
So now let's go back to what we answered by the CFPB and by the credit bureaus. It will not show up derogatory on your credit. But last week I told you what lenders are going to do is they're going to look at the payment history. So on payment history, it'll have a letter C, current, 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 but let's take it April, May, June, and let's say no payment was made. They're not going to mark it current because it wasn't current. So what we'll show is a blank in their credit history. Lenders are going to see, aha, they were in forbearance and I'm not going to do their loan. Now, because this info that we're sharing with you is less than three hours old, it, it, it only got released today. Everybody's still digesting it as to what the heck does that mean? Does that mean if, in fact, I, I still have it on my desktop. Give me half a second. Let me look this thing up really, really well, shoot, I'm not gonna be able to do it really quick. But um, yeah, I'm not gonna be able to do it really quick. What it says is those loans in deferment are gonna be categorized as those from a natural disaster and they're just gonna be treated pretty much like any other loan, so there should not be any negative consequences, repercussions, or anything else like that. And that's why Experian is jumping in and saying, not just mortgage, not just credit card, not just student loans, this thing is not gonna affect your credit or credit score at all. So Dave, that's nice, except that Dave Stevens posted a credit report on his, I think it was on his LinkedIn page that I was looking at last night, okay. and it showed a major bank, I won't say which one because I'm not positive, but it was a major bank showing um, a loan that's in forbearance. It literally just set it along the bottom, you know, of the account, and so I think that mm -hmm, it was, I mean, like, it, you couldn't miss it. So well, I think it's going to be... Original question. You know, yeah. everybody sees something different. Now people right. are reporting something different. CFPB says that they shouldn't. I'm not, I don't know which bank we're talking about and I, I, I'm not gonna touch that one. Uh, right. But you know, you have, you have a room full of uh, loan officers and you might get different opinions and they're all talking about the same loan. Right, big enough to know better. I'll say it was big enough to know better, that's for sure. So it'll be interesting to see how that all shakes out. But I think that, that's still in a flux. Um, more on this for, forbearance thing. So, um, so again, we've covered this. If you're in forbearance, they have said specifically that you will not be able to refinance. Is there a difference on the deferrals? Will they be able to refinance? Um, it looks like, again, based on today's comments, that they should be able to refinance, even though uh, yesterday industry was told they won't be able to refinance. So, so what it is, it's just a problem of liquidity. Meaning, if I can do a loan and I can sell the loan and I can get back the loan and you know my money and the price of the loan is really what I expected, cool, no harm, no foul. But if I have to greatly discount what I'm selling because of a forbearance, then I'm going to not want those forbearances. And that's why you saw credit score requirements go up. That's why you saw LTV requirements go down. That's why you, you, you know, you're seeing some of these overlays being created. So with the announcement today and with the announcement of Jenny's um, liquidity help, we might actually start seeing those uh, overlays be reduced and we might not see anybody being harmed even though they did take out a deferral or a forbearance. It's just way, way, way too early to tell. The, the announcement mm -hmm. is not even three hours old. Exactly. Um, so here's a question about this. Again, in the same thing, are services, services offering deferral programs or we're only hearing about forbearances? They're offering both, but again, the borrowers don't know what to ask for. So if that kind of a mm -hmm. question is coming from an industry professional, well, Dave, it's this, right? I mean, I heard it's that. I mean, if we ourselves don't know the difference, how do we expect borrowers to know the difference? Answer, they don't. Borrowers are mm -hmm. super intelligent people. Please give them credit. They are. But if you, the industry professional, doesn't know the difference, how the heck are you going to instruct them? Ladies and gentlemen, there is a difference between forbearance and deferral. Please educate yourselves. 
So on that note, it's interesting because I I know you've heard me beat this drum. So as we are talking about our borrowers being intelligent and understanding things, if we explain them to them, I think that as we go into this potentially even lower rate environment where you said, and I quote, there's low hanging fruit, I would just like to remind everyone that we really need to be ethical and cognizant of other people's EPOs as well as our own because as we go to refinance these people, we need to educate our borrowers that there are no no cost loans, that there's a cost to every single thing we do and make sure that you're not just, you don't want to do your own EPO, but you don't want to do somebody else, cause one for someone else either. And I think that as we are learning more and more during this whole process, I think it's time for loan officers to understand how what we're doing today fits into what happens at the end of the the process in a mortgage, right? And we have to help our borrowers so they make good choices. You're exactly right. And I have two scenarios. One is my own. I am closing on a new home tomorrow. I Guys, we can't do our own loan, right? So I'm talking to the loan officer that's doing my loan. And even though we shouldn't have had the conversation we did, uh, we'll call this gentleman Steve. Steve says, so Dave, you're gonna pay me off in six months? It was it was a very interesting conversation. And so I said, I'm gonna be looking at the LE and the CD very, very carefully. And if you're going to bat for me, I will not pay this thing off to cause you an EPO. And he says, thank you, I appreciate it. But I'm also a part of a, a mastermind group. And it was very, very interesting what went out, what went around this week. And so let me share this with you. So we have this loan officer that for many, many years has used a particular lender and has always done good business and everything's been really, really good. Bob and Betty Barber came back to the loan officer to do a refinance. This refinance paid off a loan that the loan officer had written 179 days ago, meaning Mm -hmm. it was one day short of 180 days And that particular lender, who shall remain nameless, clawed back the entire commission, even though the loan went back to the exact same lender. Now, talk about this EPO environment and talk about EPDs and everything else like that. Oh, good gravy. If we are not mindful of each other, uh, what uh, what goes around comes around. You think, oh, I'm just going to pay this guy off and I'm going to get all the money and the heck with that other individual. Uh, don't be surprised if somebody pays you off. So, Madam President, your advice, your counsel is absolutely perfect and right on. Why, thank you, Dave Luna. That is so sweet of you. Um, I think we are on the same mastermind group because I saw that as well. And um, I think it's interesting, especially with some of the lenders who would turn around and tell their people, hey, we have you you know we have this loan together you should refinance them and they're within the EPO period and then all of a sudden they're in trouble so again i was on another thread where i saw someone say what's an EPO and it's like wait wait okay so we all again need to take this maybe time to really, really educate new. ourselves yeah maybe they're brand 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 new to the interest maybe they that's right really off and they don't know so okay maybe they don't right. know That is possible. But again, this is a time for all of us to really up our game, educate ourselves and make sure that we're helping others do the same thing. Right. um, So here's something that says Eric Ludwig with Fannie Mae stated yesterday on a Zoom meeting. um, Fannie Mae deferment program will not be available until July 1st, 2020. How can a servicer offer it if it's not available until July 1st? So, again, you have to make sure that you're understanding what? The servicer is the lender today. Fannie doesn't service loans. Fannie does not talk to borrowers. See, that responsibility is to the servicers, be it, you know, you know, people that you've had on this show before, people that we all do business with. So pick a servicer, right? So these servicers are the people that are collecting the payments. Again, make, giving you the example of April, May, June. So if Fannie Mae said, Okay, so now we have our 120 days. Fannie Mae says it won't be available until July 1. Okay, so understand, Fannie is not a servicer. They are not in the primary market. They're a secondary market player. 
it's the names that you you know and 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 let's give some love to people that have helped us in the past like uwm like remen like you know you know all of these cool companies that we all like prmg that we all do business with and if i didn't mention your company it wasn't a slight i'm just we're limited on time right and so these companies are the servicers these are the people that need to front the money these are the companies that are wondering what the heck is going on and how long am i, am I going to be left in limbo so please understand the difference between servicers and fannie mae fannie mae is not a servicer so here's a good question this um and i'm I, i'm gonna add something to this because i think it says i'm honestly gun shy to push for refis i'm a wholesale lo so i'm guessing it means broker and the lenders have made it clear they'll charge back any of these loans that go into forbearance i'm facing having to pay back tens of thousands of dollars in commissions how do you address that and it's a valid question it kind of ties into what we're talking about which is if we all were ethical and did the right thing we'd be really careful about not causing an epo for ourselves or anyone else but what do you say to this guy because it's a great question so as we look at the real estate value chain what we have to stop doing is just thinking about our piece the origination part up front so if all we are is selfish and think about the origination piece and not what the heck happens after we do the loan then we really didn't understand anything so hopefully these webinars and when we're all talking to each other we're understanding the entire value chain so if you understand what happens after you've consummated the transaction you close the loan you got paid okay cool but you got paid up front now the lender is trying to collect the payments on the back end well there's the question what happens if the borrower doesn't make the payments so not only is the lender out the commissions they've advanced to us they're not getting any revenue and then all of a sudden right. we're saying, oh, and now we're going to refinance something that you didn't make any money on? The lender's like, right. no, not interested. If the borrower right now is in forbearance, don't even show it to me because I don't want it. Then you had entities like Penny Mac say that if it happens in the first and they, and, you know, they gave a particular period of time, if they go into forbearance, I mean, we're just going to make you, you know, buy the loan back. back. Well, what the heck's Penny Mac? Penny Mac is an aggregator. They take some of these smaller servicers and they say, okay, let's pool all the money together to make you look like you're a Wells Fargo, you're a JP Morgan Chase, you're a city, you're, you're a US bank, you're, you're a bigger, bigger entity. That's the one that made the statement that says, if it goes into forbearance, we're gonna make you buy it back. Well, now that lender talking to their originators, us, TPOs, third-party originators are saying, hey, if it goes back, you know, and I have to buy it back, then you're gonna have to buy it back. And obviously we can't buy it back, so they're gonna get back our commissions. So we're all in this ecosystem together. If we aren't looking out for each other, you're, you're gonna kill the, you know, the, the, the money machine, the lender that you're doing business with, and that's just dumb. So we have to take care of each other in this process, and that also means our competitors. So, if you're paying off a competitor's loan and they're going to suffer an EPO, like I said, karma, then you know don't be surprised if it comes back around and bites you because somebody else may pay you off uh, if interest rates continue in their di downward spiral, which in my opinion, I think they will continue to do. So, so back to that person's question, how would you handle it? I think it would be a, you have really good conversations with your borrowers right. about the entire situation. I think that um, remember that an EPO involves paying back a, um, a lender paid situation. So you're paying them money that they are, that they paid to you, right? So if you have the borrower pay point, then um, it will change that whole dynamic because the borrower is skin in the game, right? So right. again, I think it's, it, again, we just have to be, more professional, have more conversations with our borrowers and help them understand what, how it all fits together and how, if, would, yeah, if you're if doing a 30 year fixed loan, you're not planning basic. to do it for three months, right? Yeah, if we want to go back to the start, just think of, you know, do they have the ability to repay? Bob, Betty Barber, I understand you have a ton of equity. Do you have a job? That's a super easy upfront question. Do you have a job? Well, you know, right there, Red flag should be going up. They either do 
or they don't have a job. If they don't have a job, they don't have the ability to repay, and that loan's probably going to go into forbearance. Okay. So the the harder part is if they're self-employed. Okay, you're self-employed. What is it that you do? Well, I own a restaurant. Another red flag. But if they're in um, if they're in a tech industry, working from home, not a problem. They're still getting a paycheck. Say, so how often do you get paid? Oh, I get paid every Friday. Cool. Can I see your last week's paycheck? No problem. Can I get a copy of next week's paycheck? Yeah, no problem. Okay. If you see that, then you're going, okay, this person has the ability to repay. It is really almost that simple. Okay, Dave, pull out your crystal ball. Sub 3% on 30 year fix later this year. Okay, I didn't answer the crystal ball. Very, yeah, it didn't come through very good. Say your question again, please. Pull out your crystal ball. Sub 3% on 30 year fix this, later this year. Yes. So you're seeing sub 3% on Gubbies right now. Liquidity issue was resolved. Uh, I really, really think that we will see sub 3% conventional 30 year without points uh, before the end of this year. Yes. So, holy smokes. Um, what lenders FICO is required for VA borrowers? Uh, it depends on the lender. I did see a spike up going up to 700, but I'm very, very happy this week. Again, they're not sponsors of, of this, so we're not going to mention any you know, names and stuff, but I'm seeing the FICO, especially on government loans, start to drop. So um, I've actually seen it go from 700 to 680 to 660, re ready, down to 640 on government loans. And I just saw that this past week, which I had not seen before. Pretty much everybody's kind of, you know, 700-ish range. So liquidity, liquidity, liquidity. That's what we all need, right? Yep. Okay, so I'm going to try this, but it's going to sound stupid coming from me. So ready? Dave, yep. you demand. <laughs> Dave, you I demand. No what, okay. I have no idea what that means. But I'm going well, to take. That's probably my delivery. Speech. It was probably because I said it so poorly. But anyway, I think the essence is, Dave, what, what? you are the man. How are non-bank servicers supposed to get the money to advance the money to the investors and taxes and insurance too? And again, you know, we've talked about some of that. I think it's going to depend on the servicer. And but now we know it's four months for the bank. And it depends on how right? big they are. I mean, if they can't float, you know, four months, you know, whatever the number of months is. For you know right. these folks, I'm not assuming they started in April. Maybe it doesn't happen until like May or something. I mean, I think you just saw Best Buy um, eliminate like 5,100 jobs. I think you had mm. um, a cruise. Uh, I don't remember exactly the cruise company, so I won't say any name. But you had a cruise company eliminate 5,000 corporate jobs because so it, it just it just kind of depends, right? Um, but right. if a smaller servicer, and I'm not trying to be mean, I'm just telling you what Dr. Calabria said, said, you know, if it's a smaller servicer and they can't advance the payments, then we'll just take it from a smaller servicer and give it to a bigger servicer, which I thought was not really cool. But he's always been of the, of the mindset, let um, industry figure it out and don't get the government involved, which is kind of sharing with you his thought process of, not doing anything before three and a half hours ago. Right. Well, deep into the weeds on that, I mean, what servicer is going to want to acquire a bunch of non-performing servicing? I mean, that's the question. So his theory, it wow. sounds like, is flawed out of the gate, and that is a big part of our problem right now, right? Yeah, so, correct. yeah. Um, Dave, I'll so, you, by the way, are great questions. Yeah, they are. We have smart Hi, listeners, Christy. thank God. Hey, I want to add on to this question, and that is, if servicers are having to put money aside to make all these payments, will they then be keeping their rates a little bit higher so they're not doing as many loans to reserve that money? Because obviously, money they got to make for payments is money they can't lend. You are correct. Because, see, that's the problem. If they lend the money, that money is out. And you've had warehouse banks kind of, you know, because they're not not knowing what's going to go on, 
they've kind of come back on lines. And so, okay, okay, I made a loan, but I don't know what I can sell it for. You saw on March 18th and March 24th, you know, pricing just go absolutely through the roof. I, I think I saw a jumbo price at 10% interest. They're sitting there saying, okay, if I price this, you know, enough, maybe I can get some money for it to repay my line. And so that's why you started seeing all these overlays to say, let me make a great loan because I know if push comes to shove, I can sell a great loan. And so it, it, it was just nervousness in the industry. It's Kevin, like you said, it was that lack of liquidity where I think they will solve the, the you know that lack of uh, liquidity and time frame um, mid May. Just based on what's you know what we're seeing happening you know on the legislative front, Congress, uh, these groups that uh, these legislators uh, you know in D.C. on the House Financial Services side and you know uh, senators, both Republicans and Democrats conversations I'm having with the National Association of Realtors and others, uh, it, it, there's just pressure. Uh, what our president said today, you know, Audrey said today at 1,500 you know, people, letting their legislators know that they aren't happy, NAM has asked the entire country you know, to do that. And so uh, we're reaching out saying, hey, wait a minute, there's a problem. That's why I said pressure probably, if it's not enough in liquidity, will probably come from the Federal Reserve. Yeah, and it they, sounds like they're working on it, but good they Lord. They already have the money. They don't even have to yep. ask for the money. Hundreds of billions yep. of dollars are sitting there right now. Yep. Yes, it sounds, well, okay. So moving right along. <laughs> um, so people are asking if they had already applied for the SBA loan before the money ran out, do they have to reapply to get the money? Well, again, it hasn't. Okay, so if they've applied and the money's all gone, then probably nobody's looking at the application. So in my humble opinion, and I'm not the SBA and I'm not the, the you know, over the PVP program, you know, and I understand, you know, we have a lot of small businesses that are trying to stay afloat and pay their people and, you know, they're trying to do really, really, really good things. But on that Paycheck Protection Program, I think if it does pass the Senate today, um, are there going to be any kind of issues with the House? Is it going to, uh, I, I think they're going to have to reapply. Just short and sweet, I really, really think folks are going to have to reapply because I don't know that everybody's just going to keep those applications sitting on their desk, crossing their fingers. The information that we're sharing with you, and I'm glad we're doing it on a weekly basis, is constantly evolving so as things continue to change we're you know camp is going to try and get that out to you just as soon as uh as soon as we get together again which so i, I think, have i think next week might be our last time so jason bellevue who did the sba webinar for us a week cool. and a half ago um texted me and said um, that 310 got held up again yesterday, but expects to clear the Senate today and also 60 more for the EIDL, which is great. And um, I just texted him to see if he'll answer me quickly and tell me whether they have to apply or reapply or not. I totally um, hope I'm wrong. Uh, so I think he, he says most banks I've spoken to have said they're in process. So it sounds like they're continuing to process them. So I don't know. And that's if it passes. Uh, you could have some weird senator kind of throw up something at the last minute and say, nah, I don't like it, but let's see what happens. He says that some banks are even taking new apps as like even now. So it really does look and, like it's going to pass the Senate today. It really, really looks like that will happen. Well, and I heard about a small bank in Walnut Creek which is where I am, um, last Thursday and Friday, who took all of their staff, all of their underwriters who normally, um, everyone who could do anything, and they were all working on trying to clear these applications. And that was as they were, they had already run out of money, but they're still trying to get through the application. So I cool. think it's going to be, maybe we'll have a better answer next next Tuesday, right? That's just, yeah. And that's just the example of that particular financial institution in your city. So going back to previous right. questions, it really, really does depend on lender by lender, servicer by servicer, program by program. And so it's really, really hard to jump, you know, uh, to put everything together in the same basket and say, 
this is what's going to happen because that's just not real. Right. Okay. So um, I think we have one last question. What is the EPO threshold nowadays? Which <laughs> I, I'm dying to hear you answer this. I know. The, I know what, what my is answer the, is, but go ahead. What is the, what what? Is the EPO? They want. They want to know what the EPO threshold is. I'm guessing they're asking what is the EPO time period right now. For a so, month? Uh, okay. So how many I'm months? Gonna it, yep. I'm going to answer it truthfully, which will hurt somebody's feelings, but you know. <laughs> I'm assuming you guys want a straight answer. So it is and always has been 180 days, except there are some individuals that really don't understand that value chain and they're only looking at themselves and they're only looking at their own commission and they're you know, doing what was you know, negative back in 1958 of churning. That's when that term first came out and they're just, they're just, you know, kicking those loans and repaying them off and things like that. So for those folks that really don't understand the damage that they're doing, it's 12 months. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Present. Well, and read your, your read your broker agreements carefully is what I'm understanding too. I'm I'm realizing that a lot of people don't read their agreements and they really don't know what they've agreed to. So get your broker agreement out and figure it out because it's a big deal, right? Generally speaking, it's six months. It could go as, as long as 12. Okay, so here's a, a last. Um, a last, last one? A last, last one. Yeah, the, okay. you know, the last, actual last one, not to be confused with the previous last one. So Got if it. a borrower initiates a refi with a different broker causing an EPO, why shouldn't the borrower be subject to a clawback penalty? Okay, Dave, should we drop the... I was telling Dave about this. I waxed poetic for an hour about how I think that there should be you, some you sort of prepayment penalty because with, it was you i can't take any credit for it so madam president <laughs> why don't you share with everybody your <laughs> thoughts on that one well i have been i have mentioned this a number of times over the last couple of years and have been shut down regularly um but i really believe that if we have an epo period then we should have a prepayment penalty that matches it that way either that or just have fannie and freddie refuse to buy loans that have been paid off in less than six months that would be the easy fix, right? Regardless, again, I think it's time for this conversation happened. to happen. Okay, well, you know what? We haven't tried, right? So let's try. I have a, I have a list of things for Fannie and Freddie that I'm starting to get, uh, you know, bold about. So anyway, okay. um, yeah, I mean, we need having to be the borrower find something that says I'm not going to pay it off, having the borrower have a prepayment penalty, and here we are in the marketplace, and nobody else has a prepayment penalty. I mean, do we really think those measures are going to work? No. But if the rest of us are all trying to, you know, trying to be honorable in this profession and try and do our job, folks, we're going to make it. There, there's a ton of money um, uh, at the end of the rainbow and all and all through this process. Uh, your year in 2020, even with these hiccups, is still going to be a very, very good year. And so I wanted to end it with that positive note. Uh, it looks like Okay, like you know, like Gavin Newsom said, Governor Newsom said, we bent the curve. What the heck does that mean? I'm assuming it means that we are now uh, getting less COVID um, uh, folks testing positive. Uh, uh, it looks like the hospitals have not been overrun. It looks like you know the worst may be behind us if they're talking about lifting these restrictions. I'm going to take all of those as positive. And so in this particular industry, if we continue to play by the rules and be positive and do our jobs, uh, there, there's going to be so much money for us. It's, it's just not even funny. It's, these are very, very good times. New, new people coming into the industry, welcome. It's a little bit weird, but uh, your timing was perfect. Yep, I agree. So I think that we are at the end of our time. I want to say thank you to Megan Jackson, who is always on the back end of this thing, making sure everything runs correctly. Kevin Casey, who is president-elect for camp and also doing the 20-hour course on May 1st and 2nd. And welcome all of you to join us on our upcoming events. So thank you, Dave, Luna. We love you, and we really appreciate all of your time. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you, everybody. See you later. Bye. Bye-bye.